<clears throat> okay, Alan. Okay, well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alan Simmons, and uh, I'm delighted that I've been invited to be here uh, as moderator, but to participate in the discussion. Um, so we're here to launch a remarkable book. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to read it yet, I recommend that it. it's really quite a, a work. And uh, for me, um, it brought back a lot of memories and feelings because it got a long historical trajectory. It begins in the 1970s and runs up to the 1990s, but it, there's even in it things that come right up to the present. Uh, remarkable compendium uh, of resources for your, your research and the research of others. But you get a glimpse of what can be done with the materials that these people have used. Yeah. Lisa and our collaborators have put together. Uh, so I think we'll proceed. I, I want to say a few words, very few. Uh, and then Lisa is going to say more about the book itself project. And, uh, Just five minutes. And then others can take up to 10 or 12. Good. And then we'll move on to the, uh, the other panelists. And we have several wonderful panelists, and they're going to be, some of them may find difficulty in 10 minutes, but I will encourage you to do so, and I may pass a piece of paper your way with encouragement if it's going to be run over. We would like to uh, have the panelists say that what they would like to say, and we would like to leave room at the end for questions. So I would ask you not to uh, interrupt the panelists, uh, try to stay calm, and uh, hold your questions for the end. Um, uh, I would like to thank the sponsors of this event. The two sponsors are two research centers here in York that uh, I know very well, that I care for, because they're remarkable centers. One is the Center for Research on Latin America and the Caribbean, CERLAC, as we call it. And the other is the Center for Refugee Studies. Uh, both are housed here now. They have their offices here and have for some years uh, in this building. And they have, over the years, collaborated. There have always been things. CERLAC has never just been confined geographically. The ideas which move uh, CERLAC forward have always been global concerns. And uh, refugee studies has never just been refugee studies. It's always been concerned about context, political and social development, that lie at the roots of refugee movements. So these two things have come together, and I think that the texts in these books reflect these combined yeah. broad range of intersecting interests. Uh, I would like to uh, thank York University, of course, for providing the setting for this meeting. And I would like to acknowledge um, our today on the traditional territories of many indigenous peoples. Um, and uh, I think we think of this ever more profoundly when we think about Canada and Chile, where the same kind of issues run in parallel series. But for here, I won't go through the, the long list of people who have been custodians of this land and who we now share with them. Um, the territory is uh, currently uh, the, the treaty holders are the Mississaugas of the Credit Nation, and the, the territory is subject to the dish with one spoon um, wampum belt convention. And I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a, a notion of generosity and sharing, and um, yeah. that. It, it underlies, I think, the spirit of the work that we're doing here today. Um, for myself, very briefly, I spent a research year away from teaching at York when I was a very, very young faculty member here, just sort of arrived and went behind years, uh, to work with uh, a research agency, a United Nations research agency in Chile. The Center, Latin American Center for Demographic Research, CELADI. It was part of uh, CEPAL at LAC uh, at the time and remains so as a smaller unit within that uh, institution now. 
So I was in Chile not because I was wanting to study things about Chile or Chile in Canada, but rather ECLAX programs across the region were uh, wanting something that I could contribute something to. I had a background in survey research, collection of data through surveys, and more and more uh, the UN institutions were turning, especially for social development issues towards surveys because the census data was not always there, was not always uh, on the topics of need, and how to analyze this data and so on was part of the project. What it meant, however, for me, is I spent a year in Chile, and it was when we arrived there in 72, was absolutely most wonderful, beautiful place, both physically and locally. Uh, and maybe some of the beauty of that was that I did, was new there, and I didn't realize just how deep some of the underlying tensions were in, in society and where things were going very rapidly within six months. And in the last six months, quite a different picture began to emerge. Uh, meanwhile, in that period, I had, uh, because my interest, one of the interests was in marginal housing, how Tugorios and uh, people living in uh, squatter settlements, or living maybe legally and on land, but they had no money to build their houses, how they were working. So I participated with local NGOs, and a friend had a truck, and we used to load it up with building materials, and take it out on Saturday morning, and grab a shovel, and get in and work with people. So I learned Chilean Spanish, which was a bit of a No, people coming from elsewhere who think they speak Spanish, they don't necessarily speak Chilean Spanish. It was great. Uh, and, and then I got to know other research groups, particularly NGOs who were working in uh, fields related to health, education, and so on, and became good friends with people in Flaxo and other international institutions there. The thing that, uh, that, that struck me about the book is that it really begins at the moment when things really collapse in Chile with the gold hit. And much of it is about what happened to the uh, people who left Chile and then how they maintained links back to Chile and how Chileans came visiting, studying, so on, to Canada. One of the things, however, that Maybe it was not uh, stressed here, but uh, what it is, is, I think it's in the background of everything I was reading, is the extent to which this was just an incredible existential crisis global, progressive leaders in the social sciences. They lost their institutions, they were shut down. Many of them were blacklisted, they couldn't get jobs. For whatever reason, they might want to have left to leave Chile, but they also had many reasons for wanting to stay, family and others. So there was this incredible explosion of NGOs and NGO activity. And my work, uh, I would say, over the subsequent years, uh, and my interest still, lay in many of these NGO and NGO relationships, how we could uh, support them with joint projects, but the projects were collaborative. This is not York University going abroad to do research. It was collaborative research of joint interest actually. I worked for a number of years with uh, IDRC in Ottawa. This area of IDRC is the International Development Research Center. And it began, and there were very progressive people in that institution. And by 1974, 75, they were already seeking to get small grants of various institutions. Um, so I'm going to just conclude by saying that I can be more delighted with the, the work that Lisa and the other people have done to bring forward this history. And uh, the change, uh, the downfall, the hard times, then a return to a kind of quasi-normalcy, uh, maybe a world that people knew from before, but also the rise of new hopes. And, uh, that are still with us now and being developed. Anyway, I'll stop there, Lisa, and turn to you to explain the project. Okay. And you introduce people as they, yeah? I would. Uh, as they. Would you like start. me to introduce you? No. Oh. <laughs> we'll just leave it be. A lot of people here actually do know me. <laughs> uh, look, I'm going to provide a very, very brief introduction to the book. 
and mention a few things that the other members of this panel, I suspect, are not going to be uh, mentioning. Huh? Uh, the book consists of four sections of documents and one section of stories by Chileans. The four sections of documents were chosen over a two-year period of research in a documentation center next door. And each one of those sections is introduced by a person who was intimately involved in solidarity with Chile. Uh, Joan, uh, Mr. Walchuk is here uh, from that group of people who introduced different sections of the book. Uh, the fifth section uh, consists of stories that are told by Chilean refugees about their own experiences. And we have two persons. I know Veronica isn't a refugee, but anyway, she's a Chilena who could not uh, get back under normal circumstances. And Patricia Bascuñan of the Casa Salvador Allende. So we have uh, uh, two representatives uh, from the section of five or six uh, different stories. And then we have a concluding chapter a concluding chapter that deals with an unfinished agenda, the status of indigenous peoples who continue to experience colonial and post-colonial oppression in both Chile and Canada. And Magdalena Ugarte is the person who will uh, uh, talk about that. So, with regard to central themes that I suspect will not be discussed by the panelists, first of all, with regard to uh, civil society, which we emphasize uh, a great deal in a book, uh, because uh, uh, the solidarity was driven by civil society, churches, unions, political parties, uh, etc., uh, who had built relations with Chile a long time before the coup. Uh, but within that context, I want to pay attention or point out to you the re leading role that was played by Quebec. Uh, Quebec, both with regard to church and union participation in the condemnation of the military takeover and the accuracy of the reporting of its mainstream press. Uh, Hundreds of French Canadians have been sent to Latin America to participate in missionary work uh, over a period of quite a few decades. And they provided reliable information, uh, 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 amazingly reliable information about what was going on. Uh, what the, and while the English Canadian press was biased um, against anything that smacked of socialism, not completely biased, but significantly biased, the French language press in Quebec actually told the story of the political repression after the coup with accuracy and with sympathy. Indeed, 29 journalists, those of you who have read the book uh, know this, uh, 29 journalists who worked for Le Devoir in Montreal donated a day's wages to the local Montreal Chile Solidarity Committee. Uh, and in Trois Rivières, the Solidarity Committee, the local Solidarity Committee had access to publishing opinion pieces in the city's newspaper, Le Nouveauiste. So there, there was a different quality huh, to, to Quebec participation that was really, really impressive. Second, Chilean exiles and immigrants began to participate within the Canadian solidarity movement very, very quickly after their arrival. There was one book written, huh, you know, that I, well, there are quite a few books about the 
uh, about uh, the Chilean uh, uh, diaspora uh, in, in Canada, but there was one that, that was entitled Young, Well-Educated and Adaptable. Okay, because they were young, well-educated and adaptable, the Chileans had the skills that allowed them, for example, to begin publication of their own journals, sometimes in English, sometimes in Spanish, uh, within months of their arrival in Canada. That's quite remarkable. Huh? Uh, they also fit into Canadian politics because they were used to partisan politics. Huh? There had been no military intervention in Chilean politics since the middle of the 1930s. And people were used to debate uh, uh, th uh, action through political parties, so forth and so on. Uh, they were used to functioning in a democratic system huh? and found themselves quite comfortable in huh, the democratic system in Canada. Now, in addition to recording their own reactions to Canadian society and pol politics, the exiles journals often relied on the documents that were being produced by the Canadian Solidarity Movement, especially the Latin American Working Group, uh, uh, whose documents uh, form an important part of this book, the Interchurch Committee on Human Rights in Latin America. Uh, here we have uh, a representative of the uh, inheritor of uh, the Interchurch Committee, uh, which is Kairos and also the Task Force on Churches and Corporate Responsibility. Uh, we, we forget the fact that the first critiques of mining investment, banking investment, uh, of uh, uh, apartheid supporting investment uh, came from the churches, the, the Christian churches. Okay, third, in light of the recent revelations and publicity about church-run residential schools, it is easy to forget huh, that the 70s and 80s were a high point huh, in the influence of liberation theology uh, in, in Latin America, but also in other parts of the world. Um, and within that spirit of liberation theology, the Interchurch Committee on Human Rights in Latin America organized an important fact-finding mission to the Mapuche territories in Chile. This was in 1979. And they did this with uh, the support and participation of one of the most famous uh, and foundational indigenous leaders of Canada, George Manuel, who established the Indian Brotherhood that later became what we know as the uh, uh, Assembly of First Nations. Magdalena will be speaking about that. Huh? And finally, I want to emphasize that the record of civil society relations with Chile and the history of Canadian activism was collected by the Latin American Working Group. And the documents huh, that LAG collected are still available with us huh, in about 120, 150, huh, depending on which sections of it you count, huh, bankers boxes full of documents huh, um, on Latin America and solidarity with Latin America. So it, if it had not been, if it were not for the work that Log did, and especially the work uh, of its principal librarian, Cis Levo, it would have been extremely difficult probably impossible to reconstruct the history in a way in which we have reconstructed it in, in the book. Huh? A small fraction of those 150 or so huh, bankers boxes of documents found their way into the book huh, because we couldn't publish three volumes. <laughs> it was, would have been very easy to publish three volumes, huh? but we had to limit ourselves to something under 300 pages uh, in agreement uh, with Novalis, uh, which is the uh, uh, publisher of the, uh, of the book. Um, so the documents in the book tell a remarkable story, uh, both the good and the bad. They 
the documents that you find in a book, huh? in a and in a in the fourth, uh, well, all in the sections one, two, and three, but also section four, also, huh? provide us with the voices of the time. You know, so yes, there are introductions to all of the different sections of documents huh? um, that. Well, in some cases, they are also the voices of the time, huh? Uh, but the documents especially tell us what people were saying, huh? And uh, and what they were debating about. And we're lucky to have huh, two of the people, huh? Veronica and Patricio, <laughs> who provided their own stories of emigration to Canada here with us today. So we will now proceed huh, to Rachel. Whom you should introduce. Yes. <laughs> All right. uh, Rachel is the Kairos Partnerships Manager, and uh, she's been involved in the human rights and social justice work of the churches for over 20 years, and in solidarity and social justice movements for much longer, starting with the anti apartheid and divestment movement and the Nicaraguan Solidarity Movement in high school and the university. She holds an honors degree in international development studies from the University of Toronto and a graduate certificate uh, in gender and peace building from the University of Peace of the United Nations in Costa Rica. So Rachel, is please. Um, thank you, thanks and, and uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to to be here. Yes, I, I work at, at Cairo's Canadian um, Ecumenical Justice Initiatives, and I have for a very long time, uh, since its creation in uh, 2001, and before that in various co coalitions. I've been around for 30 years uh, or so in this work. Um, so I think my um, the, the reason I was asked to be here is because of my age and my persistence. <laughs> Uh, and, and faith in ecumenical work, um, particularly the the partnerships uh, work uh, within ecumenical work. Um, I wasn't around uh, in this work 50 years ago, um, but I have had the privilege of knowing and working with people who were more directly involved in the work. Um, the people of ICRLA, the Interchurch Coalition on Human Rights in Latin America, the Bill Fair Fairburns, the Kathy Prices, the Francis Arbors, the Joe Guns, the John Fosters, in fact, I'm pretty sure I helped John access some of those boxes of archives from the Ikerla uh, um, storage, uh, which have been included in, in, in this book. And um, I know that the history that's so carefully told in this book and documented was formative in the creation of um, ecumenical organizing and uh, organizations in Canada. The history of ecumenical work, not only in Latin America, but in international human rights and refugee rights in corporate accountability, the critical role of the churches in uh, advocacy and uh, Canadian policy dates back from uh, dates back to the inter interchurch coalition on Chile and the responses of the churches uh, at that time to the coup and the terrible uh, aftermath. So this is uh, an important story to be told and, and a catalyst, I think, for decades of ecumenical work on human rights, on refugee rights, on corporate accountability, on indigenous rights, and on grounded and effective advocacy with the Canadian government. So I'm here really um, to be brief and just say thank you. <laughs> thank you to Lisa, thank you to the collaborators and contributors and all the people involved in, in getting this book together and all the pieces of the book together. Thank you for documenting the history so insightfully and accessibly and personally and accurately and for bringing these voices together, together with this gold mine, this, this uh, invaluable um, priceless documentation and evidence. Thank you for keeping this evidence so um, so organized, thank you to people like Cease and uh, others like her in the Latin America Working Group who ensured that this history was preserved and could be found. Um, thank you for reminding us what's possible 
when the churches, when labor and social movements come together and collaborate and co-conspire and respond to injustice and demand justice. Um, in the book, it, uh, uh, I think Lisa, you write, it is a history that speaks to the importance of well-organized and coordinated civic action in the formation of public policy. And, and this is so true. Um, so thank you for documenting a history that catalyzed this ongoing uh, future and future uh, ecumenical work in international human rights, in refugees, in partnerships, in corporate accountability, uh, in Indigenous rights, in policy and advocacy with the Canadian government. Um, John Foster speaks about the legacy of the Interchurch Coalition, uh, 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 the legacy of the Interchurch Coalition on, on, on Chile in the formation of ICAR law in 1996, um, the Interchurch Coalition on Refugees in 1979, 10 Days for World Devel Development, which the educational um, uh, development education part of the, of the ecumenical work in the same year. Joan, you speak about the formation of um, TICUR, the Task Force on Co um, Corporate Accountability in 1975 and their seminal and effective work on corporate accountability uh, you write, while Canadian corporations and successive governments provided succor and financial aid to the Chilean military regime, the documents compiled here reveal how well-informed faith groups and an alert civil populace provided an alternative vision to Canadian policy, foreign policy. And I think uh, I think we still aspire to that. I think uh, within Cairo, it's within the work that's going on in Canadian network for corporate accountability, we still aspire to that. So, and, and finally, thank you for doing this now, um, when I think many of us within the current churches and ecumenical movement and beyond are struggling to find a collective voice for human rights and justice and to respond and to build organized civic actions for justice and peace that you document in this book. I couldn't help thinking of that as I thought about what to, to say in this panel. I couldn't help thinking about the current context and violence in Palestine and Israel and the Canadian government response. And uh, I think this history in this book is so important in reminding us of uh, what's possible. So thank you. Thank you. So now I would like to introduce uh, Joan Sambacher. She's a professor emerita of historical studies at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. And uh, she was uh, the director of interdisciplinary women and gender studies uh, there. She is the founding director of the Canadian Center for Victims of Torture. And following uh, her work there, uh, she continues to maintain active relations with Chile's Museum of Memory and Human Rights. Um, and uh, the Cardoso Law Institute in Holocaust and Human Rights among many other institutions that uh, deal with the history of human rights abuses and atrocities. She's also the recipient of numerous honors for her work in the defense of human rights, including her contribution as coordinator of Toronto Action for Chile, TAC, I think, uh, awarded by the historic democratic government of Chile. Jo. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's hard for a historian to be succinct. <laughs> and I really owe Lisa and Cease a lot of uh, credit for reining me in because I wanted to cover everything in the book and I wanted to say everything today, but I'll try to be short. Um, thinking back 50 years is almost impossible. Many of us um, have said that when we met before this session. And when we think back to the context of those times, the, the many imperial wars against Vietnam were finally winding down in the early 1970s. The Paris Peace Accords, the last uh, US uh, military campaigns were undertaken. And perhaps at that time, that may be one of the reasons that the popular unity government in Chile um, attracted so much attention throughout the world. It was something that looked positive and peaceful and hopeful. And it seemed to many people to be a potential model of social, political, and economic change. Sectors of Canadians also became engaged and you've heard from the previous speakers, trade unions, faith groups, civil society organizations. 
Fred Franklin was the longtime Quaker representative on the Interchurch Committee on Chile, which later became the Interchurch Committee on Latin America. And he described this affinity for Chile and the Popular Unity Project as, quote, we were part of the awakening throughout the hemisphere. We were on the side of liberation and against the historic repression of people in the South. So these same allies became increasingly alarmed at the destabilization efforts directed against Chile. Increasingly, people began to organize. The Coordinating Committee for Solidarity with Democratic Chile was formed in August 1973, one month before September's coup. And this is the group that continued on until 1992, then called Toronto Action for Chile. Um, after the coup, large sectors of Canadians were shocked at how the Canadian government responded to the sheer brutality being covered. Quick recognition within weeks of the Pinochet regime, initial rejection of refugees, and growing corporate investment in the military regime. In fact, Noranda Mining became the first international corporation to invest in Pinochet's Chile. So Canadian complicity really became a large component of the work around solidarity. As Rachel explained, Churches were galvanized on many fronts. The task force on churches and corporate responsibility. Just think about that name. Task force on churches and corporate responsibility, ticker, was founded in 1975. Had already been working on divestment from the South African apartheid regime, but it became clear that Canadian banks and corporations were investing in Chile at a great rate. So Ticker took up boycott campaigns that were first called by the emergent Chilean exile community. Um, trade unions and longshoremen, especially on the BC coast and in Quebec, supported efforts for the boycott of imported grapes and wine. All this was amplified by the Chilean community newsletter, Vince Ramos, that was produced throughout um, the, 1970s, the 1970s. So Ticker really set as its main aim, the prevention of bank loans to Chile and corporate, especially mining investments. So the documents in this section of the book reveal the developments of these campaigns. And it's really interesting to watch the growth of their analysis throughout this time. First, it was just this incredulous reaction to how could Canadian banks and mines be investing in Chile? When they tried to meet with them, they were rebuffed. They wanted nothing to do with these church groups. Um, so then they decided to research what investment meant, how it supported the dictatorship, how it held it up and enabled it to survive. Renata Pratt, who um, was Ticker's first director and a, a personal role model for me, was adamant that their research and data needed to be above report, reproach. They were conscious that they were under intense scrutiny by banks and corporations who had a lot more money to research. And it's instructive to remember that the CEOs and executives of the banks of the corporations were most often members of their own faith groups. Um, so there was always that tension within, so they knew they had to be on solid ground to pursue campaigns. Ticker circulated detailed briefs. Many are excerpt exerted in this, excerpted in this text. And they started to attend the annual general meetings of corporations and banks and to raise their concerns with shareholders who often didn't know what was happening. They were just looking at the bottom line of profit. Ticker learned to engage the press and created a reputation for solid information that they put out to the general public. They were most successful in providing transparency for how Canadian investment affected Chileans. And it was the close ties of Canadian churches with their counterparts on the ground inside the country that enabled most, much of this analysis. Ticker also, when they realized they weren't being listened to, developed by the banks and corporations, developed a set of guidelines for ethical investment that they tried to get these institutions and the Canadian government to adopt. 
they were less successful there. Noranda became a major focus uh, for Ticker, not only because it was the first mining corporation in Chile, but at this time it decided they would try to get the Canadian government to stop any of this investment. And they were in, originally encouraged by the Canadian government's public response, condemning Chile at the United Nations, um, issuing human rights um, statements in support of um, actually against the torture, disappearance, and deaths in Chile. And they publicly continued to provide support for human rights. But Ticker came to realize that on the other hand, and you can see this in the documents, their actual shock that they see this. But then on the other hand, they discovered that the Canadian government was providing export development grants and permits to investors, yes. even those supplying military equipment to the dictatorship. Other institutions picked up the divestment campaign, and I just quickly want to mention, because universities were quite active. York University, University of Toronto, and Queen's University had an amazing coalition of staff, faculty, and students who, act after a consistent multi-year campaign to divest, to get the University of Queen's to divest from Naranda, were successful. And just to share with you that their camp, I think they had an inspired campaign slogan. It was, Naranda gets the copper, Chile gets the shaft. <laughs> This duplicity, the Canadian government duplicity, was best understood, I think, in what has become known as the repugnancy issue. And these documents show this very clearly, the repugnancy issue. Again, the duplicity of the Canadian government. When ticker solidarity groups and individual citizens wrote the federal government protesting Canadian involvement in support of the dictatorship, they received replies, quote, Canada would never provide financial support to regimes deemed wholly repugnant to Canadian values. Only after further prodding did the government finally admit that it had never designated any country as repugnant. <laughs> it was just a smokescreen to throw people off the track. I mean, that's amazing. And just to wrap up, it was a challenge for me and ultimately Lisa, the editor, to provide uh, how many times she went back to the journal in 60 more pages anyway, <laughs> to provide a representative picture of the richness that remains in this archive. And really have to thank Cecil Lebeau, law librarian, who carefully curated these documents over decades. While it's impossible to reprint the entirety of the briefs and solidarity reports, it is impressive almost 50 years later to see the work that civil society accomplished. Um, I have used their word inspired throughout my remarks here. Usually I cut out repeated words, but I did it this time because I really find the work found in this archive inspirational. And it's our hope that this volume will empower readers to consult the archive for a fuller and deeper understanding of the importance of Canadian divestment and boycott campaigns in the interest of justice and human rights. And as we know, the world still needs that to be done. <laughs> Now I'd like to introduce uh, Magdalena Ugarte. Magdalena is an assistant professor in the School of Urban and Regional Planning at Toronto Metropolitan University. Uh, her work examines uh, the relationship between planning, settler colonialism, and other forms of institutionalized dispossession. Since uh, 2014, she's worked with Mapuche partners in Chile regarding questions of Mapuche planning, law, and territorial reconstruction. Her doctoral research about the implementation of the duty to consult with indigenous peoples in Chile received the Barclay Gibbs uh, Jones Award for Best Dissertation in Planning of the Association of Collegiate Schools of Planning. She has also worked in government settings in Chile and Canada. Magdalena. Thank you, 
Lisa for bringing us together and today's club if you remember for being here and so I think I was mentioning I I was not around the time um the solidarity efforts <laughs> happened here between China and Canada and I'm coming to this book from a different angle I am someone who for the past eight years has been working around indigenous rights in Chile particularly with knowledge partners um, and in that context, that my co author and my colleague, Victor Carinier, who I left, was back in Chile, he's not here, so he can't be present today. Uh, so we wrote together this chapter, this concluding chapter of the book that looks at a very particular maybe angle of solidarity between Chile and Canada uh, in the context of the aftermath of the war, uh, which had to do, as Lisa and others have mentioned, with a fact finding mission. An observation mission um, led by the interchurch community on human rights in Latin America to Mapuche territory to observe the reality of Mapuche rights and violations of Mapuche rights in the context of the Pinochet regime, um, and then more specifically looking at the effects of a uh, law that was, um, I mean, the technical name is Decree Law 2568, also known at the time as the Indian Law. Uh, that was enacted by the Pinochet regime with very specific aim to uh, break down community held in uh, Mapuche land as a mechanism in a way to resolve uh, Mapuche identity and Mapuche rights associated with, um, with the, the unique status of indigenous peoples. Um, so this, the idea, Lisa mentioned this, this uh, commission uh, went to Chile in 1979 in November and they were there for a few weeks. And it was significant for a number of reasons, uh, one of which uh, and that is that uh, George Manuel, as Lisa mentioned, was part of this mission. Um, that was also composed of uh, John Kilburn, uh, Marc Lapierre, and Simon Smith uh, from the Church Committee. Um, and, and, and the fact that George Manuel was part of that com committee or that mission was really significant given his role in the indigenous rights movement more broadly, which allowed the mission of the reported reviews to really reflect and see parallels between what was happening with Mapuche people in Chile and other contexts of uh, internal colonialism in the Canadian context. Um, so the one of the things that I don't want to go into the details, I mean, you can read the book, but there's so much amazing material uh, that Cyril that has collected. Uh, but one of the things uh, that was really significant about this, and I appreciate that it was kind of put at the end of the book as kind of like an unfinished uh, conversation, mm -hmm. uh, is that that fact, fact finding mission was really sharp in denouncing what that particular law was trying to do in the Chilean context, um, and denouncing some of the dynamics that other speakers have uh, mentioned here. So one of the um, of the insights that they shared in their their final report that they shared both in Chile and here in Canada, it was this transition from the over violence of the initial maybe stages of the dictatorship to subtler, uh, if you wish, like policy techniques, uh, that in a way rather than necessarily relying on over violence, really criminalized any action that would run against any people and subverts, particularly economic imperatives. Um then the other piece that was really sharply read by the committee or by the mission was how the division of Mapuche lands that might have looked like a land use planning device, I, I mean a planning department, so I'm not particularly aware of that land dimension, was actually an entry point to kind of again resolve you know, Mapuche identity and all the rights that come in international law too, they are to indigenous peoples as peoples. And when your identity is not tied to the ownership of the land only. So, in bringing the lands to the market, there were economic imperatives to make that land available for occupation, for extraction, and, but the more the, the notion of diluting, assimilating indigenous uh, rights. Um, then also, some more institutional changes that were put in place by the dictatorship, such as the dissolution of the Indigenous Development Institute. And in a way, all indigenous matters go into different silos, like education to the Ministry of Education and then the land rights into the Ministry of Agriculture. And in doing so, by dissolving uh, or dissolving um, institutions in charge for indigenous rights, again, kind of this assimilation uh, vision, 
And, and then more broadly, how this decree law, the Indian law, was really opening the door to the transnationalization, uh, particularly of the agriculture, um, but which also again, like, had important implications for other economic activities. Um, so what we try to do in this chapter, in addition to kind of documenting and synthesizing a bit what that uh, final mission found, uh, it's really um, highlighting some of the continuity between what they announced at that time and what we can see today, 50 years uh, after or 40 years after. Um, and in a way, situating that particular law in the context of a lineage of other uh, policies in Chile that have really uh, and continue to do so today to uh, take over Mapuche lands and basically um, kind of deal with something that happened here and how to deal with the quote unquote indigenous or Indian uh, question. Um, and also, uh, another thing we try to do is look at not only what was happening in Chile and, and with Mapuche people at the time, but also the parallels with things that were happening in other parts of the world, including Canada. So, what this law was doing was really uh, resonating with the white paper of 1959. Some of you might be familiar with that at the time. We have to had introduced trying to abolish the Indian Act, for instance. So, we, we could see, and, and George Manuel was really instrumental in showing those parallels. And, uh, or later attempts to convert a First Nations land here in Canada into the simple land basis to create their mature market. And, um, but then finally, maybe another twist of the chapter or uh, a reading that we did of the material was um, how, uh, when we talk about solidarity, there, it can take different forms. And in the same way that there were powerful um, civil society action, really progressive uh, activity taking place, some of the complicities that John and other people have mentioned were also really present, particularly the complicity of Canadian corporations and banks uh, with this interest in government interest in Chile, and the impact and how, in a way, the indigenous rights question uh, comes into play uh, in that context. Um, so yeah, I think one of the things we wanted to uh, do was to highlight really the, the, the power of the fact finding mission, how sharp it was in announcing the political situation, showing this parallel, uh, but then also raising the question about well, what we can learn now and more than 40 years after the mission and report happened, uh, uh, did the end of the dictatorship in particular for the Norwegian nation mean any substantial gain in terms of rights? And I'm not going to bore you with the things that, that are happening at this moment in Chile in terms of the very long list of laws and things that are happening that really continue to show uh, a, that, that kind of those complicities of Canadian corporate interests. Um, but then also how the, this land question continues to be very much at the center of yeah. Um, yeah, assimilating and, and really uh, deepening it different forms of internal collaboration. So also even the door open for what the, the book can bring for those particular things. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Patricio Vascunia and of the Casa Salvador Allende. Uh, he holds a teaching degree in history and geography from the uh, University of Chile and taught in various public schools in rural communities as well as private schools in the districts of Santiago. Although his aspirations to advance his higher education at the Pedagogical Institute at the University of Chile were cut short by the coup, he later completed a Master of Arts degree at the University of Prague, then went on to a career as a uh, professor at George Brown College, many years in different campuses of the college. Um, and uh, he edited two very important books that are in the spirit of uh, the, this larger project uh, that uh, we're discussing today in this book, Chilenos in Toronto, Memorias del Exilio, and Chilenos in Toronto, Memorias del Post Exilio. Um, Patricio. Okay, thank you. Okay. These meetings made me so many things to, to my friends. So, so many times. <laughs> I mean, 
I will try to see the other when at the end, then 50 years ago was elected. I was a militant of the Socialist Party of Chile, and therefore very active uh, doing work in different fields in the community, in the university, where we have a group of socialist university students, the so called Dinar Universitaria Socialista. <laughs> I was uh, 29 years old when the military group happened. I'm 33 years old when I came to that right? to Toronto specifically. Um, I left, I lived in the dictatorship and the dictatorship three and a half years, a country with no unions, no political parties, no parliament. No opposition media, nothing. And too much did nothing. Crime, torture, disappearance, etc. So it, but I'm so happy to be here because this is one of the few times that I remember that I am in an audience where the academia and the community are together. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is quite, quite important. Probably I am not an academic today because I dedicated my life since 1977 when I came to the law to, to the solidarity with the causes that were important in Chile. And since then, I didn't stop. I arrived in 1977 and did today, every year, single year, I'm being involved in politics, in solidarity with, with, with children, particularly with the dictatorship between 1973 and 1990. I happen to see so many faces also who I have seen for decades in the community, Canadian and Chilean, like Magali, Chilean, John, long time, very well known. I prefer not to mention another name because if I forgot <laughs> to say it, and someday I'm going to be in trouble. You want to say it, by the way. <laughs> so, at any rate, it's not easy, I mean, in my understanding, to, to be in this kind of thing that most communities should be being part of this. But if, anyway, I'm going to try to bring things that are, I'm being part of this. And uh, first of all, let, 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 let me tell you that in the 1970 year, no, in the 70 year where the year when the human rights absolutely are no more 50 years ago when it happened. It was a concept used, politically speaking, as well as the international law, which is very important today. Very important today. I mean, everything that's happening globally, international law is present over there, of course, right inside the human rights. Uh, to protect them became a powerful movement in the world. This created an exercise of the collective memory. Salvador Allende, in 1939, this is the vision of this president, former president of Chile. In 1939, the parliament said, people without memory is people without fusion. In 1939, when he was elected a member of the parliament at that time, the brutality and the number of uh, detected Chile in the 70s in South America, we have the Queen Chile in 1973, in the same year, three months before, in Uruguay, it happened the same thing, the coup. and three years after, in Argentina, in 1976. And all of these detected fields were characterized, characterized for the same thing, torture, kidnapping, disappearance, concentration camps, and as a result, the people who came to Canada seeking political asylum from this country, they didn't seem really apparently John or very mentioned that the status of refugee. When I came in 1977, that status didn't exist, it was in process. And in 1978, I believe it was imposed. And when I came to Canada, I came as in everywhere. Even though we have a political background like many other people who uh, look for 
the place to go because the place lies where the main is. It, is it, it is important at this point to say that, for example, during the year end of the global urban, I didn't understand at that time why the, spread, the media called them PET. <laughs> I was paying to know. At the beginning, it was very confused with that. And then, I mean, the government at the time was not really in the The Pinochet Junta is a semi dictatorship. And so, those seeking political asylum in Canada were in there. Among them, in my case, in Canada as Latin immigrants. And they were not recognized as political refugees by the government of Canada until that year. Chilean exile, another point of view, influenced the refugee policy. In, it is in my understanding, reading some and uh, what happened at that time, we influenced in some way the um, refugee policy. I'm at the same time the concern with the human rights. To recognize recognizing political exile from right wing dictatorship. The Immigration Act came into port just in 1998. Okay? And for the first time, there were a distinction between refugees and immigrants. Okay? But it's important to stop that here again. There are two kinds of refugees in our community at least. The, camp, the one who came for political, pure political reason, and also another kind of to be refugee for economic reasons. There are so many people who were living in poverty in Chile, particularly because the imposed, when it was imposed in the, in the, in the, the dictatorship, a very hard economic policies that affected the poorest uh, people over there in Chile. That had an impact on so many people came as a uh, economic refugee. That started probably in 1982, 83. There are different kinds of information, which one day, which, what, what year, what exactly the year when people start coming for economic reasons and not necessarily political reasons, which started exactly after the, the coup in 1973. The first group of exiled people came just in. In the same month, in September of 1973, and of course, they were landed in at that point, no refugee boys. Uh, and I had to recognize at this point also the Canadian solidarity, all the progressive people who were working together with, the, with our community. Uh, something that is happening in so many countries around the world. Easily, we can identify more than 40 countries where the solidarity worked. And uh, Canada it wasn't, it wasn't an easy play compared with Europe, where social democratic governments, more progressive governments, were doing some with the right way, that quickly, some work with the Chilean community. Well, here we have a, a different community, a different way to think, a cultural way to think, political way. Uh, and I can give you an example, for example, the San Oriente split, mm. which is located in the area of Newton mm. and Washington. Okay. It's been two cars. I think it's 20 years. I was that was happened to me. Because we didn't have the correlation of force inside of the city hall. Okay. To tell us this is the moment that we can get an split in and that is a, an example. I mean, that happened. We are talking about almost 40 years after the war. In Europe, there was a different vision. Easily, we have library, museum, stream, so many uh, avenues, uh, parks, with the name of South Africa. This is the only one in Canada, by the way. Um, well, at the end of 1973, one of the beginning the solidarity, the solidarity committees, uh, uh, Canadian solidarity committee, were already working easily in the fair market. As for, for example, we have the Interchange Committee on Chile. This was one. 
The Interchange Committee of Human Rights in Latin America, which was connected with Chile too. The Toronto Committee for Solidarity with Democratic Chile, another one. The Toronto Action for Chile, led by John, that is over here. Thank you, John. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John, for, for that, for the well -well. And uh, And we had so many people who was doing solidarity, Canadian people, uh, particular people from different churches, uh, who were doing solidarity here, knowing previously the process of changes in Chile, like the case of John Foster, John Foster is not yeah. here today, yeah. I remember he was, uh, he was there in Chile uh, in 1972 for the coup. Right. And uh, it was a first kind of experience, what he did, uh, what he did there. Uh, we met, I mean, the Canadian, Canadian activists and progress people. Today, unfortunately, some of them, they are not here with us. Uh, we paid tribute to many of them in 2013 when, uh, when uh, was, uh, we were commemorating the 40 years of the 40. Okay. And uh, the Canadian activists, uh, they were. Uh, behind the solidarity and there were two expressions of the Canadian solidarity. One, working with the popular unity, where we are the one important parties of the country policy. And yet it's a very particular the Communist Party and the Socialist Party. And also, they, they were separated from, from the popular unity, I mean, like, uh, independent, but they were collaborating each other. And the second group, there was a group that was close to the a revolutionary led um, um, movement, which is called the MIR in Chile, Movimiento de Izquierda Revolucionaria, where that Canadian people are doing solidarity too, where we're working together inside of, the, the, of this, that organization. What we, what we are main, our main of, uh, object of the goals for us as a community, well, first of all, condemning the military regime, okay? Denouncing the violation of human rights, denouncing the, inter in the international orders, the dictatorship of that, supporting the people's struggle in the restitution of democracy in Chile, boycotting the Chilean products, among them wine, which I love it as it is, <laughs> and great. Okay. Denouncing all the, uh, like the uh, uh, campaign, no, denouncing and or stopping the Canadian investment in Chile and doing a lot of campaign by the way against Canadian investment. And finally, relaxing funds for the Chilean resistance, the detector Chile in Chile. Finally, because I was called at this time, I can tell you that Chilean brought to Canada a lot of political experience as a leader of factory workers, junior leaders, uh, university leaders, people who work in the government. In that community, came in the first 10 years, it was a community of people with a lot of opinion on hearing how to lead something. And that's the reason because you can find easily, just in 1974, months after, uh, uh, after the coup, we have already the first Chilean, the Toronto Chilean Association in, in Toronto. But not only that, uh, I'm sorry for that, you are being being <laughs> only that, but also it was very important we created a true school in the 80s, we created the school Salvador Allende, uh, Escuela Salvador Allende, uh, which has, uh, was uh, aimed to create in 1981 to children and family of the exiled uh, people in order to prevent them if they want to return to Chile. And also, uh, for example, in 1977, it was created a co-op with 50 human, uh, due to aid and two with 50 human. In 1977, it was here in partnership where uh, the Ontario Community, uh, Community Housing Corporation, that was the idea, okay? In partnership with, it was created that uh, uh, co-op with 50 units where I live, by the way, around 10, 10, 10, 10 years, and it was a great place where to be. 
Ale Paloso, we have David, eh, Escuela Mineros de la Paz, which lasts about 50 years and just closed because the Ford government didn't provide any more funds for them. Well, I have no assignment. We have a, a, a scholarship about a year. provided to a, a post secondary students, uh, Spanish speaking students. Uh, and we have so many other things. But I have no more time. <laughs> so, Uh, Veronica Chile. Um, Veronica was born and raised in Chile. Uh, she's Professor Emeritus of Political Science at the University of Western Ontario. She's a research fellow in the Berlin-based project Desuet Igualdades uh, Net, I guess you have yes. the Net, Desigualdades Net, uh, which ran from 2010 to 2015 of the Grupo de Trabajo Feminismo, Resistencia y Proceso MS Vectorios of Claxo. And uh, she's associate researcher of uh, Desigualdades y Derechos Humanos, Nucleo Interdisciplinario de Excelencia, Universidad Austral de Chile. Most recently, she's held various visiting professor positions at Chilean universities under the modality of Científica de Excelencia del Extranjero, Proyecto Conocid, MEC, and also in the graduate program of the Latin America uh, Institute Frey, Universidad of Berlin. Veronica. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you so much for uh, to Lisa for convincing me to participate in this project because I wasn't really convinced that I could pass for uh, the real thing. Um, and um, as I, you know, as I mentioned, so I'm not going to go over the little blurb that I wrote for the collection, but I, I have to say before anything else that I am absolutely delighted to be sitting next to Alan Simmons, mm -hmm. because if it weren't for you, I would not have had the right language in my idea of the application <laughs> to be able to finance two years of research in Chile from 1986 to 88. So thank you so much. <laughs> So I am, as was mentioned, not really an, uh, a political exile, even though I left Chile at the age of 16, almost 17, in 1971, escaping with my mother because there was no divorce law. And, uh, you know, if a woman abandoned the home, however abusive, and she didn't show physical abuse at the police station, she could be thrown in jail, not so the man. So, uh, you know, she basically escaped from the country, and this is how I arrived in the United States, not Canada, where I finished high school and I spent eight years of my life fighting my time to get the hell out of there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, I was reflecting on the fact that, you know, I haven't really taken stock of what that life was like there because I was very much a witness and a participant, not only of the end of the Vietnam War, but also of the last year of Osvaldo Letelier as ambassador mm -hmm. in Washington. And in fact, through Connections family, we helped organize the last uh, Fiestas Patrias in, in Washington before he went back to Santiago. And then I was there in 1976 when he and his uh, you know, colleague, Ronnie Muffet, were killed by a bomb planted uh, with the uh, awareness of the CIA and facilitating facilitation of the CIA. Uh, and it was pretty close to where I was living at the time. So, you know, so this is all before I came to Toronto, where I actually met the Chilean community at OEC. Uh, where I spent two years, and then I moved to political science, uh, political economy at that time, uh, in the field of people to figure out a way to get back to Chile in 1986, which is what I had wanted to do for a long time. However, I realized uh, that uh, it wasn't, it would not be easy. 
So even though I had every intention of going back and staying, I realized I was no longer a real Chilean and I was not, not really a real Canadian. So I occupied this in-between position uh, that has allowed me to reflect, and this is what I would like to offer today. Uh, and I would like to dedicate uh, the, these words to two people in my life who were absolutely fundamental. One of them is Lumi Videla, who was my teacher, and she was a member of the movement of revolutionary left, uh, who was tortured to death while uh, eight months pregnant, and whose body was tossed into the Italian embassy grounds. And, uh, you know, and how did I find out about this? Well, by having breakfast and reading the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. So it was such a scandalous of a story that it made it into one of these fillers, usually reserved for, you know, bus careens of a clip in Indonesia, you know, 20 death. Well, there was this description of my teacher. Um, and I subsequently found out that in fact, she had been tortured to death and they had gone too far in front of her husband and most likely her seven or eight year old son. The second one I would like to honor with these words is Maria Isabel Beltran Sanchez, who was my friend and classmate and who is now one of the disappeared. Uh, she has never been found. And how did I find out about her? Well, there used to be a wonderful Hungarian restaurant on Bloor Street. Mm -hmm. Uh, which many of you remember, where one could get analysis, APSI, all the journals that exist no more because they were defunded by the incoming conservation, I have to say it, as a way of eliminating critique from the left. Uh, and it is in that publication that there was, in 1984, a human rights dossier with the story told by Marie Isabel's mother about how she had diligently looked after her until she found her in a concentration camp or a detention camp, absolutely destroyed. And her last words were to her mother, Mamita, don't come back, right? So this would have been my reality. So I'm neither a refugee nor a child of refugee. I am someone who escaped that mess. And my mother is con was convinced until she died that she had done me a favor. So what I would like to do today is just very briefly, because I don't have much time, use this space to say, you know, why remember all of this today? And a bit like, you know, I want to take, take up Rachel's point. What is the role of memory and the role of history? And I was reading recently a text that, you know, where the author, and I forget, uh, Pato, I'm like you, I forget who it was. Uh, history by itself and for itself doesn't have much value unless you're a specialist, of course. Its value lies in what it can tell us about the present. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, so this is, you know, the, so the question I want to leave us with is what can we learn 50 years on? And here I want to thank Lisa again, because reading the texts of the book and rereading them has provoked me into yet another area that I want to dig deeper into, and that is the one of historical continuities, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, <laughs> I am struck, first of all, by the generosity and commitment of people from civil society in Canada, deeply struck. But I am also deeply struck and disturbed by the continuing attitudes of you know, the diplomatic corps and official Canada in terms of how it relates to the Northwest. Mm -hmm. And it was basically the words of the ambassador, Andrew Ross, that really provoked me the most. And so I would like to just, uh, in, in relation to uh, Christopher, Chris Alexander, who had an article in the Globe and Mail last weekend, right, invoking yet again the need to go to war for liberal democracy, right, at whatever cost, without too, doing too much damage 
Mm -hmm. But, you know, defending what's happening now and the support, unilateral support that we're giving in the Middle East, uh, as well as what we're doing in Ukraine for the sake of liberal democracy. And I thought, you know, this reminds me, it takes me back to Andrew Ross, our ambassador in Chile at the time, right, whose commitment was to liberal democracy in the context of the Cold War uh, and what he shared with the rest, let me put it that way, at the sake of generalizing, is an actual absolute contempt for communism and communists, right? So that that could justify everything. Mm -hmm. So as, uh, as John Foster and Bob Carthy remind us in their uh, letters of the time, you know, he just kept minimizing in Santiago uh, the, the atrocities being committed. Mm -hmm. The killings, he said, are abhorrent, but understandable, right? Uh, you know, there is, and in fact, at some point he said, you know, xenophobia seems involved in killing foreigners who had been working with the popular unity, particularly Cubans and Brazilians during the present consolidation phase, which, you know, has been mentioned, was not called a dictatorship, right? It was, you know, a transitional government doing, as he put it, a thankless task. Mm -hmm. So uh, he describes, and this is where I want to focus, he describes the, the junta's methods, which even he admits as being reminiscent of the Nazis. Mm -hmm. as being indelicate and abhorrent and understandable. And I have been, ever since, you know, I read the book the first time, <laughs> it, digging into bits and pieces of my own family history, because like so many of us, I also have divided uh, backgrounds, right? So uh, very Spanish on the one hand, mestiza, mm -hmm. But on the other hand, a, a German Chilean, which is its own creature, past of lies and secrets about the degree of support of the Nazis and the Nazi period uh, and it, its involvement in Chile. And lo and behold, in the context of preparing notes for our first book presentation, I came across the work of a recent uh, uh, journalists and researchers, including a historian at the Hebrew University, who are in their own languages translating uh, and interpreting declassified documents from the secret services. So, much to the contempt and uh, you know disdain of Andrew Ross, our ambassador. What becomes clear from reading this material, which have yet to be found in a common language, so those of us who can speak several languages are lucky in this case, what one can conclude from them is that, you know, the atrocities committed by the Latin Americans, as Zapato said, in Argentina, in Chile, and Uruguay, were committed, were taught. This is because he says at some point, when well, these are Latin America, this is South America, what do you expect? Mm -hmm. The 3,000 tortured in Santiago alone. No, they had been taught. Why? Because the rat line or form of criminal, Nazi criminals, made it out of Europe and out of the Middle East into South America with the support of the Vatican, with the support of the various security services in Europe, as well as the security services in Israel. So Walter Rauf, and I will end with this because I feel rather passionate about this, Walter Rauf, known for having invented the mobile gas chamber that has, according to uh, Danny Orbach, the Israeli historian, is responsible, personally responsible, for the extermination of 700,000 Jews. He ends up in Chile, and he ends up being the head mastermind, technical scientific expert in the destruction and disappearance of bodies for the DINA, which is Pinochet's security force. 
you know, and the same is true as uh, Uki Gognis, an Argentine writer, revealed some 12 years ago for the case of Argentina. So what we have here, as I said at the beginning, are continuities that we also need to think about, especially in relation to what is happening now. What is the price that we pay for this black and white, you know, uh, ways of telling stories, which remind us, you know, which on the other hand, uh, what, what I rescue from this is that the habit of practicing historical amnesia is one that continues to be alive and well. So I leave you with this because I think the history we read, if we read the detailed accounts in this book, there are there are enough details there that should make us think about the, the, the style of debate and what doesn't get said in, in the present context. Anyway. I would like to, we are coming to the end of the panel, uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce a brief introduction to Fernando Andres Morales Godoy, uh, who is uh, the uh, advocate, he's the counsel here in the Chile Council in Toronto. And uh, Fernando, I apologize, I don't have a, your CD, so you might want to say a little bit about your own background, but first, and uh, then go on and please uh, give us some remarks uh, from the perspective that we have. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, all of you, for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, I'm the Consul General of Chile in Toronto since the last year, since October 2022. I'm a career diplomat from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I was posted before uh, in Cuba five years between 2009 and 2014. And then my career continued in Latin America, in Ecuador, from 2015 to 2020. So it's my third post as diplomat, as senior diplomat in, here in Canada, and my first experience in English. So be patient. <laughs> so um, it's an honor for me to be today. Uh, uh, all of the testimonies are really uh, hard. Uh, I I I talked I, I talked with uh, with Patricio so many times about this uh, because I was posted in Cuba, so it was one reality of of our exercise. Another another completely different issue in Ecuador, but also we had a strong <coughs> and the experience of the Chilean community here in Canada. And first of all, uh, I want to say thank you. Thank you to all the people that helped our exercise here, our political activities. Uh, solidarity was really important, was so important in order to face one of the hardest dictatorship in Latin America. Um, it's difficult for, for me, it's, a, it's always a difficult for me and to talk about this as a representative of the Chilean state because. Uh, the dictatorship is one of the darkest pages of our Chilean history. But uh, this year was so special because it's our 50th anniversary of the military coup. But uh, I would like to remark some uh, a little bit of things that the government has tried to, 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 to build during this year in order to commemorate this, this anniversary. You know, if you follow the political reality in Chile, you can notice that we are living now a, a complex moment. It's well, we are a divided society, especially during the last four years after uh, the social unrest, our year 2019. Uh, we are uh, experienced a second process to trying to change the constitution. I cannot make comments about that, of course, as a friend, I could do it, but no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's difficult, it's kind of difficult. So uh, the government uh, tried to, to fix a strategy in order to three constants. One of them is what Patricia says, and Veronica, memory. 
If you saw the inauguration of the Panam Games you know, on Friday, you notice that the Olympic fame uh, entered to the National Stadium, the biggest potential company, the Olympic Championship, to through the, the, the space for memory. Where is the, the quote of Salvador People without memory, people without future. So the government said uh, memory, democracy, and future. So the testimonies that uh, Lisa edited at this book, and also I want to, to remark the work of Casa Salvador Allende this year, they, they edited another book about the testimonies of their child and the grandchild of their sides here. And it was supported by our ministry, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, because the effort is uh, to keep the testimony, to keep the memory, because it's the only way that the new generations uh, have, uh, have an idea about the brutality of the dictatorship and the need to care about democracy. Um, I was born, I, I talked to Alan before, uh, I was born. Uh, during the dictatorship, when the dictatorship ended, I was 11. Uh, but the generation that came after us, they think that democracy is for granted. But no, Chilean was uh, uh, more one of the more uh, strong democracies with Uruguay, and the both democracies fell down in 1973. So uh, everyone who's, uh, who is in politics uh, has to. Uh, renew his commitment with democracy. And that commitment with democracy is not possible if we don't keep the memory. So uh, that's that's what uh, I like so much, the work that you, you did here, because uh, the new generations need to know the work of international solidarity and the testimonies of, of everyone who, who, who helped to the people who suffer and the people who suffered during the past age. Um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, as I said, uh, has worked uh, with that, has supported all the efforts of the Chilean community abroad in order to keep our memory. Uh, there, there will be so many different activities like the books, like, uh, like, like different, other different cultural activities in order to preserve our memory. And also to remind solidarity not only from Canada, uh, but other solidarities from other countries and uh, the division of cultural affairs of, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is in a book that collects all the uh, uh, features, I don't know how to say it, <laughs> Poster, posters of the solidarity internationally from all the world. It's really beautiful, it's for free. I can let you, I, 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 can, I can give you the link in order to, there's Canadian poster and poster from everywhere. Yeah. And it's pretty good. So, uh, to, to open a space to the debate, I think the more interested I get with so, um, Thank you all for, for the opportunity to be here. Thank you all for the possibility to know the work of you. Um, be sure that uh, at the consulate and also my colleagues in the embassy in Ottawa, uh, we are committed to continue supporting the work for the preservation of memory, the memory for democracy and for better future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was an honor for and uh, it is uh, our good fortune to have uh, some space now that we can have questions. Also, Michelle, I guess there are people still online.